good evening, members of the board. Um, tonight we're going to start with an instructional highlight on early literacy, and it is a <coughs> pleasure to introduce to all of you returning uh, board members and new, our instructional supervisor for um, humanities at the elementary level through K-5, Ms. Bethany Morrow. We have a number of instructional coaches that I can kind of see behind our program, and I want to thank um, our instructional team for being here tonight. We have Nicole Paterla, Megan Del Monte, Karen Coyne, Elisa Petoniak, and Marsha Lopez. I think I got everybody. And Sarah Monaco. And Sarah Monaco. <laughs> Sarah Monaco, front row. Um, we're so delighted to have our entire instructional team um, that uh, is working alongside many other colleagues in our schools to support literacy instruction in Milford Public Schools. And as you read recently, um, in a board update, we're looking forward to sharing with the board tonight uh, some continued findings from our 2019 district study. So for returning board members, you'll recall that in 2019, we engaged in a district study to learn about our literacy practices in district and how to really grow a stronger foundation in the area of elementary literacy. And uh, for our new board members, we'd like to also let you know that you'll have a chance tonight to learn what some of those commendations were from the study and also some recommend recommendations for our next level of work. Um, specifically, we're going to talk to you about how we've actioned some of those recommendations already. Uh, for example, with the support of the board, really expanding and diversifying our libraries, thinking about how we're aligning high quality instructional practice in the area to strengthen literacy, and also um, our work in the area of really ensuring that we have a balanced, comprehensive literacy program. You might also recall from the, um, the agenda that was sent to you for this particular instructional highlight, there's some recent information that was released from, released from the State <coughs> Department of Education on the Right to Read Act. And so there were a number of materials on that act, including the General Assembly Bill, and um, a letter from the Connecticut Association of Public Schools, um, CAPS, a letter of response to a memo from the CSDE that came out at the end of September outlining what would really be some sweeping changes in the world of literacy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We do have some concerns not only about the potential financial impact, but um, how some of that work might not be really in line with our district model for high quality instruction. Uh, we believe that our work in district to date to really strengthen our curriculum and to focus on high quality instructional practices in the area of literacy is exactly uh, what we need to do to be building a really strong foundation for our youngest um, readers, writers, speakers, listeners, and thinkers in the public schools. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Morrow, who will begin our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Morrow. Thank you very much, Dr. Fedigan and members of the board. Um, as Dr. Fedigan said, uh, ironically, five weeks before we shut down in uh, 2020, I stood before this board and I outlined much of what a 2018 program review had entailed. And some of those recommendations you see before you tonight. So one of them certainly being high quality classroom libraries. We knew we needed better books for our students. We needed to make sure all students were seeing themselves in text and we wanted to make sure they were aligned with the curriculum. We wanted to talk about a comprehensive literacy approach. The term balanced literacy gets a, uh, a tough name, but we really want to make sure here in Milford Public Schools that we are encompassing all the five pillars of literacy and we are making sure that our students get the best, most comprehensive literacy experience. Finally, um, another recommendation was that we revise our resources and make sure that they are in alignment with our district model for high quality instruction. With this board's support, we have been able to do all three of these. So in um, the last two years, even with COVID, we have updated resources in K through two. This year, we've updated our instructional resources in three through five. We have also uh, spent quite a lot on redoing our classroom libraries, which we'll talk a little bit more about tonight. Certainly, these are not done. Uh, we are never done in the area of literacy, but they have made huge uh, transitions and very important um, ground moving in terms of our instruction. We believe that our, uh, our vision for literacy here in Milford Public Schools is that students are actually our primary resource. We think that no one program could possibly meet the needs of every single student we have. We think that the best way to help students is really to equip our teachers with high quality curriculum that are, is in alignment with our district model for high quality instruction. We believe that that curriculum needs to be research aligned 
and it needs to make sure that there is embedded professional learning. We are so fortunate tonight because we have a small sampling of instructional coaches who are here to support our teachers on any given Tuesday. So if a teacher comes up and has a concern about literacy, they have four instructional coaches in their building who they can talk to about that need, about that student, about whatever it is that the research may be telling them to do with that student. We believe that high quality instruction is really the way that we are going to meet all of our students' needs. And we believe that we are working towards our best practices, again, research aligned practices in literacy instruction. Overall, Milford believes in investing in our teachers. When we talk about a comprehensive literacy approach, we really are talking about five pillars of reading. So you'll notice before you are the five pillars that as we've defined. So the first one being phonological awareness. This is an area that has been more recently talked about in the last few years. In Milford, we have adopted a program uh, that specifically supports teachers and students in the area of phonological awareness. We also know that phonics is the next step in student learning in the area of reading. In terms of phonics, Milford has implemented a new research-based curriculum that is both based on the current Common Core standards as well as the science of reading. Another area, another pillar of reading, excuse me, is the fluency. This was the um, prioritized standard from the state over the last two years, so it continues to be a priority for Milford. We know that fluency is a very important part of learning how to read. Vocabulary, when we talk about vocabulary, we're really talking about morphology and talking about points of the pieces of the words and how students are understanding those words. And finally, comprehension. We want to be very clear here in Milford Public Schools. We believe that deep thinking actually can happen in kindergarten. Our youngest learners are our most vivacious learners and are often our deepest thinkers. We just have to give them an opportunity to share what they're thinking. So we believe these five pillars of reading should be an integral part of our K-3 programming. As Dr. Fedigan mentioned, we of course are always in service to our model for high quality instruction. Tonight I'd like to draw your attention to the two particular areas where we have circled. The first one is intentional planning, formative assessment, and feedback. This particular area is really important when building teacher capacity because, of course, your learners in front of you look different every year. So it's important for us that we are grounding our teachers in how to use formative assessment and the resources that they have before them to make instructional decisions for any child that comes into their classroom. I also want to draw your attention to the part the engineer to engineer. As we mentioned before, Milford is very lucky with the board's support to have four instructional coaches in each building. Two of these coaches are very well seasoned and are knowledgeable practitioners in the area of reading. And so at any given time, they are in classrooms supporting teachers with how they are learning best practices in reading and really helping them understand the science of reading as we are now knowing it. I also want to ground us in our change of materials. So uh, in particular, in the intentional planning area, we want to make sure that our resources and our materials are in service to high quality instruction. So we've moved away from graphic organizers and worksheets because we really want to see students doing the work. And we're going to give you some examples tonight of how students are learning and what it looks like in the areas of literacy. We believe in Milford Public Schools, in order to get at this model for high quality instruction, a big piece of it is allowing for voice and choice in our students' everyday life. Some significant shifts we've made in reading, you'll see before you six shifts. So this work is grounded in Jan Birkin's work, it's called the Six Shifts in Reading, and it really talks about six moves you can make that will help align you with the science of reading. So the first one, I know it's a little bit hard to read, um, is rethinking how reading comprehension begins. As I mentioned before, we in Milford Public Schools believe that this starts at kindergarten, probably even at preschool. We know our youngest learners, our preschool learners, have deep thoughts and can share those thoughts. We are recommitting to phonemic awareness. We know that this is a really important area that often we don't talk enough about. People think that students come to school with phonemic awareness. We know that it's an explicit skill that needs to be taught. We are reimagining the way we teach phonics. As you heard before, we have recently realigned our phonics curriculum so that it is based in the science of reading and research-based practices. 
We are revising our high frequency word instruction. We're going to talk a little bit about sound walls tonight and how things might look a little bit different than the way we used to think about uh, high frequency words. Um, we're reinventing the way we use the MSV, the queuing systems. We know that meaning will always be important, but we also want to make sure students are decoding words. And finally, we are reconsidering the text that we look at for beginning readers. Tonight, we're going to highlight just a few of the shifts that we've made and show you some of our very own Milford Public School students engaging in this work. So first, I'm going to introduce Nicole Bertula, who is our teacher leader, Pre-K-12 Literacy Support Services. Um, hi, thank you. Um, so one of the shifts um, that Mrs. Morrow talked about is really recommitting to phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is the spoken sounds in words. So before we're even looking at the word, being able to think about the sounds, hear the sounds, manipulate the sounds. Um, so here is a quick video of um, an example of some of the work that is happening in a second grade classroom around this. Nose. Nose. All right, so this is just a really quick example of a second grade teacher explicitly working with students using hand motions and thinking about the different sounds and words. Um, phonemic awareness is really critically important because it's the foundation um, before you're actually reading words and making that connection from the sounds to the symbols. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Megan Del Monte, who is our instructional coach for <coughs> Pumpkin okay. Delight, and she's going to talk a little bit about orthographic mapping. Thank you. So, um, David Kilpatrick refers to orthographic mapping as the process in which students can store and easily retrieve words. Um, we know that in order for students to really own words, they need to not only be able to read them, but also be able to write them. So one of the high leverage routines that we have implemented in our new phonics curriculum is um, phonemic graphing. So essentially, the students are using sound boxes and they um, segment the sounds and words, and then they add the graphing, the letter or letters that go with those sounds. So here's a little video of the students doing that work in a first grade classroom. Let's hold it, please. You're shaking your head now. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't come up. It's um, not, there's no yeah, it I I it. I yeah, it, it was working it before. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely it wasn't working when I'm drawing. If you go down to the very, very no, last There place. we go. Okay, Maybe yeah. that's it. Nope. Uh, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, The next shift we're going to share with you is all about changing and revisiting high frequency word walls. And uh, Karen Coyne and Marsha Lopa are going to share this, our instructional coaches at Live Oaks. we are making a shift from teacher-centered word walls to student-centered sound walls. 
um, to support high frequency word instruction. And this slide highlights some of the differences. We began working with sound walls last year with our first grade team, and we are continuing that work, which includes kindergarten and second grade this year, as, weather, as well as sharing out with our fellow coaches. Why are we making this shift? Because of the science-based research. In order for students to make the connection between speech and print, we need to explicitly teach students how to hear and articulate the individual sounds and phonemes. So what is a sound wall? Sound walls consist of uh, phoneme graphing cards that are posted on the wall, and they are sectioned into <laughs> vowel sounds and consonant sounds. And using high leverage instructional practices that Meg has referred to are essential for high frequency word instruction. And the sound wall encourages students to analyze words and notice unfamiliar and irregular spelling patterns. For example, when students encounter the word no, K-N-O-W, on a sound wall, they would most likely place that under the sound of N, not the letter K. Because when they are writing and they need to refer to how to spell that word, they are going to be thinking N, and they will find it easier as opposed to the old word walls where it would have been under the letter K, which is confusing for them. The sound wall becomes an instructional tool and student resource to reference throughout the day. So we decided, because we started this last year with first graders, that we would interview our second graders <coughs> to find out what they had to say about sound walls. And here's what they said. Excuse me, I'll, I'll read it um, for you because it looks kind of small. But if I don't know how to spell words, I look for what I hear. For example, if I'm looking for the word could, I look for the k sound and find it under the stop, says Sarah. Aria told us, if we have a tricky word, we could look for any other words or parts of words on the sound wall that sound the same, then we can sound out the word. Jameson informed us that it helps us with spelling, especially with tricky parts. The letter O in of has a heart above it because it isn't the sound of ah. These are hard words. And we also asked some teachers to give us feedback about the sound walls. And one of our first grade teachers says, students have led the conversations around sounds and where to place the words on the sound wall. They are all part of the conversation and owning it. Second grade teacher, placing the words on the sound wall and phoneme graphing mapping have helped improve their spelling. And another grade one teacher, the sound wall makes children think more carefully about the sounds they hear in words and the way letters combine to represent those sounds. So we know another shift that this board has been wonderful about supporting is classroom libraries. Of course, we always want students to have that authentic experience like we look at in the HQI model. So Ms. Sarah Monaco and Elisa Petoniak. Sarah Monaco is our teacher leader for pre-K-5 literacy, and Elisa Petoniak is instructional coach at Pumpkin Delay. Okay, good evening. So we wanted to make sure that we thanked you so very much for the opportunity to put all these wonderful texts in the hands of our students and our teachers. And the excitement, not only for the children, with the children, for these new texts, but the teachers are equally as excited to have some new life um, put into their classroom libraries. Um, quite frankly, the kids are beyond thrilled to have new books. They took the agency and the teachers let them to organize the classroom libraries and set them up by genre and determine where books were going to go. But they're really more importantly excited about the fact that they're seeing themselves in books and the diverse collection that we've been able to accrue so far, mm -hmm. it's just been amazing. As they were sorting, kids were already making predictions. I wanna read this one first, I wanna read this one. They're making um, suggestions to each other. I just finished this one, you should do it. They've set up more, um, anchor charts where they, you gotta read this book, it's great, the characters, you'll love it. So it's just been really wonderful for them to have access to these and the teachers are excited too, just to have new books and just get an excitement around reading in the classroom, it's been wonderful. 
So again, I'd like to thank the instructional team before you tonight. How fortunate are our teachers that this is the experience they get to have on any Tuesday. If they want to know more about phoneme graphing, they have great, amazing resources within their buildings that they can learn about. They don't have to wait for a training. They don't have to wait for anything else. They have this amazing professional learning opportunity at any given moment to help coach them around their students. So we are so appreciative for that support. Um, I also would like to say, uh, you know, the board has been very supportive of classroom libraries and instructional resources. We are so very thankful for those resources because they have brought us back to a love of literacy. So many of you will remember that when I stood before you in 2020, one of my most important pieces of literacy was that students never lose their love of literacy. And I think from our youngest scholars to our students who are here this evening tonight, we wanna make sure that that is anchored in all we do, and we are so appreciative that this board is supporting it. Unfortunately, as Dr. Fedigan um, indicated before, there is some new legislation out that we are a little worried might take us off our path. So many of you have seen that there is new legislation out and it is called the Right to Read Act. <clears throat> the legislation states that on or before July 1st, each local and regional board of education will uh, notify the Literacy Research and Reading Center um, what reading curriculum model or program that they are implementing. So this is a major shift from how the state has done business in the past. Uh, generally, we have had the opportunity to have a conversation like this around what we're doing with curriculum. It has not usually come from the state. So you'll notice that there are some state responses to the um, legislation. Uh, the CSDE developed a Connecticut review process last spring. Um, each uh, district who wanted to was able to put in a um, program for review. Uh, I say program because they didn't really look at a comprehensive curriculum. So I wanna be really clear that Milford believes that one program could not possibly meet all of the amazing things that are happening tonight. You've heard us mention several different resources, but we don't necessarily buy a boxed program and put that in front of our students because we don't believe that's high quality instruction. So you'll notice that the uh, review process was really around programs. And unfortunately, um, when there were several opportunities for programs, but not a lot of opportunities for curricula, which was a mix of programs. So you'll notice that as uh, they, the state um, wanted to find evidence-based, scientifically-based, and aligned areas of reading, they adapted a lot from Curate, and they looked at um, a lot of the information from the Massachusetts State Department of Education. Um, we want to share with you tonight some concerns we have about the legislation and the state's reaction to it. So this is part of the CAPS memo that you received uh, in your packet earlier. So I think one of our biggest concerns, as we mentioned before, is that we don't really believe that one program could possibly meet every student's needs. We really believe, anchoring back to that vision, that we need to equip teachers with the resources and the professional learning in their toolbox to make informed decisions. You'll notice that the first bullet point up here talks about the fact that instead of adopting reading curriculas, they really adopted off-the-shelf programming. So there are um, five off-the-shelf programs that were adopted by the state. Um, we'll also know the sec notice the second bullet um, that they are requiring um, certain uh, instructional methodologies or materials in the area of literacy. So again, as I mentioned before, this is quite a sizable change from the way that we've done business in the past, and I think really important for the board to take note of. Um, again, I think it's really uh, important to remember that Milford has been so fortunate to have this long-standing visioning for literacy, as well as a model for high-quality instruction. Everything that we have done in the area of literacy over the last several years even within COVID, has been in service to our model for high quality instruction. We are really concerned that by buying an off the shelf program, that wouldn't really align to our district's model for high quality instruction and might be an overreach because the state wouldn't know Milford, our community, or what our learners need. So we have some major concerns about that. Beyond the concerns of the overreach and the off-the-shelf programming, we also have some other financial concerns. 
So of the uh, five programs, we have reached out to all vendors for quotes because again, if this is going to be a state requirement, we wanna do our due diligence. Uh, without any professional learning, this stands to be about a $1 million cost and it would be expected that it goes in July 1 of 2023. We also would need to realign whatever resource we did end up going with uh, to HQI because that is our district model. We have done a substantial amount of work. We're not going away from that district model. So whatever we purchase, we would need to make sure teachers are very clear that HQI is still our district model and we would need to realign the resource to make sure it fits. We would also need to realign our classroom libraries. Our current classroom libraries have a strong research backing. When we chose to purchase them, we used a vendor who had a strong research, but also tied to our current programming. There is a concern that if we were to go with a new programming, those classroom libraries may no longer align. The mentor text would not align. We would need to relook at that. We also would have an impact to our established cycle of curriculum. As you've seen before, we have a very specific laid out uh, curriculum calendar as well as a curriculum revision cycle. This would have a major impact on that as we would have to overhaul curriculum again in the areas of K through three. And unfortunately, we've just done that in the last two years. We are able to apply for a waiver. You'll notice that there, and I apologize because I know this is small, there are a couple of things I'd like to, you to note. Um, the first statute says that a reading curriculum or model program for grades pre-kindergarten, pre excuse me, to grade three, uh, has been, that has been reviewed and recommended, could, we could just implement that. We could turnkey it and we could flip it over. Again, the concern being that that does not align with our students here in Milford Public Schools certainly not with our district model for high quality instruction or the vision we have for literacy. I also would mention that the statute says pre-kindergarten. At this point, the state has not approved any program for pre-kindergarten. They have not found one that they agree fits. So it could be that the board goes through, we adopt a program for K-3, and then in a year from now, we have to adopt something else for pre-K. Uh, pre so we have some concerns about that as well. The second part is that you can apply, you can request a waiver to implement a reading curriculum model or program other than a model reviewed. So this is something that we think Milford would likely do. So as we mentioned before, everything that Milford is doing right now is grounded in the science of reading. We are grounded in research-based practices that are there to support our teachers. So what does this mean for us? Milford is staying the course. We are not looking to uproot our teachers. We believe in teacher capacity. We believe that knowledgeable teachers and teachers who are given on-site embedded professional learning through the area of a coach are the best way to help students who have either reading difficulties or who are accelerating that reading. We believe instruction, you know, coaching is a prime example of embedded on-the-job support. We believe in 2019, when we stood before this board, we outlined a comprehensive literacy program and we are staying that course. Our values have not changed. What we believe is a comprehensive literacy program and research-based has not changed. We believe our continued work in the area of curriculum and instruction will help to support best practices in literacy. And finally, we will apply for a waiver. We will use all of the resources and research that we have have used to develop our curriculum to create a robust comprehensive literacy curriculum for all of our students. Thank you very much for your time tonight.